Yeah, let's get started. So thanks for having me here. And uh, today I'll be talking about well, decoupling computing and storage for stream processing systems. Um, yeah, I come from the uh, from a academia background. I graduated from the University of uh, National University of Singapore seven years ago, and um, so it's actually quite the the, the experience is quite um, interesting when giving a talk in university back in the university, right? Because for this days, where I just gave talks, all kinds of talks in the industry conferences. But when I want to give a talk in, that, in university, I need to think, okay, look, uh, what kind of research you can do and what kind, how I can say something about, uh, talk something about, uh, your, uh, something about uh, your research, right? But anyways, I, I believe that uh, this is a pretty interesting topic and uh, there are tons of research you can do, uh, not just in the industry, but also in, 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 uh, in the university, okay? Oh, let's check, let me check. Okay, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm Ying Jing Wu, and I'm currently a founder of uh, Rising Wave Labs. Um, before running a company, I was uh, at AWS Redshift, and uh, prior to that, I was doing uh, I was a researcher at uh, IBM Armadan Research Center. I obtained my PhD from National University of Singapore, and was a visiting PhD at the Carnegie Mellon University. Mm. So uh, one slide about, okay, what the writing wave is and what are we doing in a company? So the writing wave is a distributed a SQL streaming database system. So you can think of a, like, okay, distributed, uh, dis distributed SQL database for stream processing. Um, when we pitch, uh, pitch, up, uh, pitch people, we, we typically say that, okay, okay, SQL stream processing with Postgres-like experience. And we also say that, okay, it's more like um, more than a modern alternative to Apache Flink, because I believe that a lot of people know okay, what Flink is, right? Um, and we open source the product in um, last year, in April 2022, 20, 20, on the Apache license. And over the last, uh, last one year, we gained to 4.5 GitHub stars and 400, uh, uh, around 400 forks. And, uh, we also have a Slack community with uh, 800 plus uh, members. And we have already, uh, the system has already been deployed in dozens of, uh, I mean, because we're an open source system, right? We actually do not know how to, we cannot know everyone, right? Or everyone using Rising Wave, right? But we know, uh, we directly, uh, we directly collaborate with dozens of uh, uh, companies and help them to deploy writing wave in their uh, in their uh, in your data stack. Okay. And but we do track the daily download and daily deployment, the Kubernetes deployment. So we have hundreds of daily downloads. Yeah. Um, so that's the open source deployment map uh, as of uh, this month. Okay. You can see that, okay, we actually get a lot of traction. I don't know why, but we actually get a lot of traction in Europe. So we don't really have any entity in Europe. That's yeah, kind of interesting. So right now we has some connections with Stack B. Uh, Okay, so look, uh, think here that okay, the, the first version of Writing Wave was just written in C++, and uh, essentially it borrows the DuckDB's front end, including parser, planner, and optimizer. And essentially DuckDB borrowed Peloton's front end. Peloton, I'm not sure whether you know Peloton, but well, Peloton was a, a database there for CMU, Kanchmelon University, right? Um, and I was actually Peloton's top one contributor. So when I check the DuckDB code, look, I, I feel that, look, well, this is my code. And, uh, but now that I know that, okay, uh, DuckDB have already evolved over the last few years, right? And uh, it has already gained uh, a lot of actions nowadays, right? And the code base has really changed a lot, but at least for well, the initial version, it was definitely based on Peloton. Um, yeah, and I'm still the number one uh, contributor of uh, Peloton. But in, but unfortunately, Python the project was like that, right? Well, if um if you are in, uh, if you are familiar with well, what Andy Pavlo was doing, he is he is currently working on some other project called Noise Page, right? Um, 
Yeah, so that's something about riding wave and uh, DuckDB. But riding wave is uh, similar, very, uh, very similar to DuckDB. Riding wave is also Postgres compatible. Um, and uh, the first version was single node, was single node system. But for essentially, we think that the stream processing can should not uh, be just a single node. It should just be distributed, and that's why we. Uh, evolved the system and essentially uh, two years back we rewrote the system in Rust and now everything is in Rust. So that's um, a little bit background. Okay, so let's talk about the stream processing. Mm -hmm. So streaming data, yeah, I actually think believe that okay, many people have already known uh, uh, stream, streaming processing, right? Uh, stream, data streaming, right? Or Kafka, Flink, whatever, right? But for well, let's think about what streaming processing is, uh, what streaming data is. So think about where you have a IoT data, right? Where you have a sensor, so you have a camera, you have a whatever, right? Um, and or uh, you you definitely want to collect those data fr uh, from your devices and uh, and uh, insert them into your Kafka, uh, Pausa, Rependa, Kinesis, right? And you may also have the uh, data logs, right? You, you have the, the system log, right? You have all kinds of log. Or probably you have some, let's say, stock marketing, up, uh, a, um, a st a stock trading applications, right? For all these kind of applications can generate uh, streaming data. And all this data can be stored in these messaging, messaging queue systems. So we call this data streaming data, right? But definitely streaming data is just more, more than yeah, data stored in messaging queues. Even if people use operational databases like okay, MySQL, Postgres, Yuga, right, or whatever, right? They, uh, this data can also be considered as streaming data. Why? Just to think about okay, um, after inserting the data into the, uh, from your applications like okay, e-commerce like um as click or some other applications into your database systems. We can essentially use, a, a, um, you, you will essentially get a, get a something called a Red Hat log or the Bing log, right? The Bing log is essentially streaming data, right? Because it's, it's, uh, it has sequence and uh, it's essentially a series of data, right? This is also streaming data. Once we get that data, People are pretty interested in gaining real-time insights from this data, right? Probably we can do some uh, monitoring, do some automation, do some alerting, and, and do some dashboarding. People just want to in, uh, get real-time insights. Then how do we do that? Well, we use stream processing systems. We use systems like, okay, writing wave, or we use systems like Flink, right? We use systems like ACDB, PIX, BioX, and many others. We use this, we use this uh, streaming, uh, stream processing systems. And the system, system cannot be replaced by, by some other systems like data warehouses, because what data warehouses were uh, actually optimized for batch processing. And uh, these systems can also not be processed by, uh, uh, this data can also be not processed by OLAP databases like uh, ClickHouse, like even for DuckDB, I don't really think that we can process streaming data because well, all of these data systems are using the full, full table scan, right? Well, using the full computation model. But for streaming systems, it's incremental computation, right? It's incremental. It's not full computation, um, right? So that's what that, that's why stream processing system are pretty unique. Yeah, to to summarize, well, the streaming systems are a system that can continue continuously ingest the data from the upstream systems like Kafka, like like your applications, like your RTB databases, do transformations and optionally deliver the result into downstreaming systems. And that's stream processing systems. And one of the most important uh, feature of stream processing system is to uh, process a stateful operations like drawings and aggregations, right? There are many more other stateful uh, operations like window functions like 
yeah, group I, right? Well, but but I just want to mention, okay, drawing ag aggregations, right? So these these two operations are pretty are pretty popular and are pretty common in real world use cases. Yeah, just to think about well, you if you want to do an ad monitoring, right? You want really want to draw in the error impression and ad, ad clicks, right? If you want to do ser uh, server anomaly detection, you really want to join TCP performance metrics and the dealer monitoring metrics, right? And for this, for the financial risk control, you really want to join the um, user traction data, uh, user transaction data, and the user risk reading data, right? These are all joins. These are all stateful operations. Stateful, managing stateful operations, are pretty, uh, supporting stateful applications are pretty challenging in the stream processing systems. Why? Well, because first, well, the computation logic can be quite complicated, right? Think about, okay, if you want to join 10, 10 data streams, right? It's kind of 10 we join. How to handle it, right? Yeah, even in DuckDB or in, in ClickHouse, right? I don't, I don't know whether they can handle, let's say, joining dozens of data streams, right? I still remember that well, a long time ago, there was a paper called Joining a Thousand, a thousand Data Streams, right? I've got who wrote the paper, but well, definitely a join is one of the most important and most complicated um, uh, 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 operations in, the, uh, in, in database systems. But and different from the old, uh, but different from the conventional database systems for, for streaming data for streaming database systems, streaming data workload can fluctuate, and this brings more more complications. And why? Because for the if the workload fluctuates, it means that you actually have to adapt the system to the workload. Right? That's kind of that's kind of complicated. Most of the existing stream processing systems actually unfortunately fail to support stateful computations efficiently, right? So definitely I, I, I highlight efficiency efficiently here because well, well, if you do not care about efficiency, if you have an unlimited resource, definitely, I mean, you can probably do that. But if you're talking about efficiency, unfortunately, these databases cannot these streaming systems cannot achieve that. And they will either be too slow or directly crash. Why it can crash, or I will talk about later, but because, okay, there may be states, right? Internal data, internal states, and the states can grow, and you may hit, hit, a, hit, a, hit a memory limit, and you crash out of memory, right? It's kind of common. So, yeah, let's talk about. And let's talk about okay, how to uh, the, 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 why stream processing is challenging in details. Let's just consider joining two data streams. One is the impression stream, and the other one is click stream. If we want to join these two streams, streaming data, okay, streaming uh, do stream joins, then what do we need to do? Essentially, we need to maintain two states, right? One is the state for the, uh, one is the hash table for the impression stream, and the other one is the hash table for the click stream. And we, 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 and, and we need to match these states in a certain way so as to support a streaming application. So imagine that you now you have the two, these two states. Every time a new table comes in from the impression stream, we will need to check okay whether it's a uh, whether it's a match in the in the uh, in the hash table for the click stream. If there's a match, we emit a result. We emit output, right? And similarly, if there's a if we if there's a new tube comes in into the click stream, then we need to check okay whether there's a match in the hash table for the impression stream. If there's a match, we deliver an output, right? The thing here that okay the key challenge here that how to manage these internal states. Well, we can definitely manage these internal states in memory or in their local desk. But the problem here is that, okay, as I mentioned, for streaming data, for streaming processing, the workload can fluctuate. If we see that, if we see more data comes in within, let's say, a, a certain period of time, then definitely the state size will grow, right? If the state size grows, then probably you need to swap the data from your memory to your, your, your local desk. 
But if the state uh, if if the state cr uh, keeps groaning, unfortunately, the system may crash, right? And what what makes things more complicated is typically we need to join multiple data streams. And joining multiple data streams can be much harder than joining just two streams. Think about, okay, the, here we want to join, let's say, five tables, right? Here we need to join the item table and a long item and part table first. Do some do joins, and then we join the results of these two, two streams with the supply table, uh, supply, supply table, right? This is the yeah, this tree is called also called a uh, lambda deep tree. So essentially, you can feel that uh, you can find that okay, if we join multiple multiple data streams, then the complication can grow, right? It will be super complicated. So if it, so that's why stream processing, data for stream processing is so challenging. And now let's talk about okay, why the conventional data streams cannot data stream processing system cannot handle the um uh, uh the why their design can, uh, cannot fit into uh can cannot be cannot handle the stream present well okay so let's talk about okay uh, think about okay the the data data stream systems invented over the past 10 or 20 years 10 or 20 years right think about the spark spark streaming a uh, flink spark streaming storm assembly right all these databases, all, all these stream processing systems essentially adopt a MapReduce style computation model, right? They actually, uh, they actually couple the compute and the storage uh, the, the, the layer. And let's think about, okay, we want to, we want to run this stream, a stream processing job in three node. Then what will happen? Essentially, you partition the state into three parts. Shuffle them and, uh, and uh, migrate them into every single node, and then do computations locally. I mentioned compute storage coupled, be, uh, and it means that okay, the computation will only access uh, the computation in a certain machine will only access the state in that specific machine, and it will not guess uh, uh, have some remote access. In this way. What we can expect is that performance is pretty good. But unfortunately, if the state keeps growing, we will find that okay, it will run out of memory, right? Run out run of the load disk, and uh, eventually it will crash. So that's why the conventional stream processing system fail to, uh, fail to support uh, uh, stateful stream processing efficiently. Then let's talk about okay the cloud native uh, architecture. Okay, nowadays we we uh, we got a chance to build a stream processing system in the cloud, right? What the cloud means? Cloud means that okay we essentially can purchase the resources on demand. We can essentially we do not need to purchase let's say ten machines at once, right? We can just purchase okay the, the resource when we need that, right? We. And more importantly, we can purchase the component instead of a machine, right? We can purchase the storage, we can purchase the, we can purchase the compute, we can even purchase the network traffic, right? We can purchase the network bandwidth. When right? everything is decoupled, right? So this makes us to think about okay, whether we can build a stream processing system in the cloud native style, in that can uh, that can top uh, all that can adopt the so-called decoupled the compute and storage architecture. So if we want to, if we do that, then what will happen? Essentially the thing we can, we can do is to maintain this local state or uh, the computation state in, uh, uh, in, a remote store, in a remote storage, let's say S3, and do computation locally in, in EC2, right? This is pretty standard. And if the computation, if the compute, if the internal state grows, then we do not need to do anything because for S3, it's, um, it's elastic, right? It can scale in and out on, uh, based, on the, based on the volume. And we do not need to, we, we do not need to control it. We do not need to sh shuffle it or we do not need to partition it, right? It will grow infinitely and grow and all shrink infinitely, right? And what if we run out of compute resource? Well, simple. We can just add more machines, 
right? And the machine can, it's every single machine can access the, access the remote storage, right? This is pretty simple. So if we adopt such kind of architecture, then the, uh, doing stateful computation can be so uh, can be pretty straightforward and uh, simple and straightforward. Let's go back to the this case we're drawing two data streams, the impression stream and the click stream. What we can do here, I mean, with the with a decoupled computer storage layer uh, architecture, essentially we are put a state in the remote S3. And uh, as I mentioned, well, if there is a workload, uh, if there's a workload fluctuation, the state grows bigger, then what will happen? We do not need to do nothing. And we do not need to do anything because for anyways, the state is maintaining S3 and S3 will handle everything. And I just mentioned, if, the, if we run out of compute resource, then nowhere is just add more EC2 instances, right? So, uh, yeah, so that's that's how the that's how the decoupled compute and storage model works, and the decoupled compute model uh, doesn't really only affect the uh, the execution, but also affect the lesser scaling and the in the failure recovery. Yeah, this is a comparison of the uh, of the uh, of the MapReduce uh, compute storage decoupled architecture and the uh, so called compute storage storage coupled architecture. Let's see how these architectures can do uh, handle uh, can handle failure recovery and elastic scaling. So, in the stream processing system, one of the uh, one of the key uh, one of the key feature we need to support is to support failure recovery. Right? It's different from the different from all lab databases such as okay DuckDB or, or ClickHouse. Streaming the stream processing systems need to ensure that okay, it's, it can always recover from failure and recover the computation. Why? Because well, for DuckDB and or probably ClickHouse, right? Well, if the system crashes, then you can just reboot a, a reboot the system and rerun the query. But in stream processing systems, since the computation is continuous, you cannot just recover the system and restart the restart the computation from the very beginning. That's not possible, and because what if the users have the uh, uh, needs to process, let's say, seven days data, right? It's not possible to to uh, wait for seven days uh, to recover, right? So what do we should do? We should do checkpointing. We should periodically checkpoint the local state to the remote storage, so that okay, if no fail, then we can recover from the from the from the last uh, latest checkpoint, right? For the couple of the computer, uh, for a couple of the computer storage architecture like Blink, like some uh, Spark Streaming, what they all they do is to paradoxically checkpoint the state in compute nodes into the persistent layer, persistent storage. That's what they did. But in in cl uh, cloud computing storage, the couple the architecture, the thing will be totally different. Essentially, as I mentioned, the state is is maintained in the remote storage such as uh, S3. And S3 is a persistent storage. So in, because of this, essentially we can treat the state as a checkpoint, right? We do not need to, uh, we do not need to have a, a checkpoint paradoxically. We can essentially use the state as a checkpoint. So what it means, let's think, think about the okay, a node failed. If a node failed, in, uh, if a node failed, uh, well, uh, in in the compute and storage couple uh, with with compute storage coupled architecture, what we will do is we will put another machine, reload the state from the latest checkpoint, and after re after reloading, we can restart the computation, right? So there will be a downtime. What's a downtime? Downtime is uh, is from the state crash and uh, the, the machine crash to the state is fully reloaded because we, if the state is not fully reloaded, then we cannot do computation. We cannot uh, continue the computation, right? So that's a downtime. So what about will the compute storage decoupled architecture? Well, with this architecture, everything becomes simple because this, as, men, as I mentioned, the state is a checkpoint. If a node failed, then essentially we can put another machine and ask that machine to directly 
load the state from the access the state from the remote storage, and there will be no downtime. Why? Why there's no downtime? Because again, again the state is maintaining S3 and uh, and the state is always there, right? Away. It's not it never get lost, right? So we can we can just manipulate it. The the only the only trader of his application for the first few accesses will because we slows from S3, it can be slow. That's possible, but there will be no downtime, right? Then let's about let's think about uh, elastic scaling. So elastic scaling is pretty similar to failure recovery. Um, essentially, we can use exactly the same model, right? Think about what the uh, and let's think about okay, how we can scale from one machine, one of the machines, two, three machines, right? With, with compute storage compact texture, what we can do with that, we can essentially partition the state in a local machine into three pieces and put both three machines, migrate the migrate state in these three machines and 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 do the uh, do do uh, do the migration, do the workload migration. Right. And right, we transit the workload from one machine to three machines. Right. That's that's how the compute storage coupled architecture uh uh handle uh, how that architecture handles uh, elastic scaling. The problem here is that, okay, the implementation can be pretty tricky. And uh, because, well, we first, we need to think about, okay, how to migrate the state, right? And there'll be some consistent issues if you're, if you're familiar with the state migration, uh, if you're familiar with the, the state migration or the other data migration problem. And second, uh, there will be actually a downtime, right? Or the other scale, or the elastic scaling is not transient. Well, it takes time to scale out, right? Why? Because well, you have to load all the state from one machine to three machines, right? But when we still compute and the start the cop model, everything got changed. Essentially, we can just load three machines and ask these three machines to load state from the S3 as from the persistent storage, right? And we do not need to care about the previous machine because, well, anyways, we only hold hold the cache. Right? We, nobody cares about cache. Like right? if the crash is, then crashes, right? We do not need to care about the cache. So that's how the elastic scaling will uh, will do, right? So to conclude, the benefit of the decoupling the computer storage architecture is that okay, it can infinitely and independently scaling uh, 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 scale the compute and the storage layer. And also where it can do trans transient failure recovery and elastic scaling. So that's a benefit. So until now, everything looks good, right? The problem here that for the everything looks too good. Because well, there's no so it seems that well, there's no Paid off, right? For it doesn't really make sense, right? So if you build a system, you should know that. Well, okay, if you only find have one benefit, then there must be something wrong, right? So yeah, definitely, I believe that also you, we have we have so many problems about well, the the so called well, the, the couple of computer storage architecture, right? So what's what's going wrong and what doesn't really make sense? So look, the thing doesn't really, that doesn't really make sense is the S3 latency. S S3 latency can be overly high to stream processing systems. Well, if you're talking about Snowflake, if you're talking about the Redshift, okay, all these database systems also have so called decoupled computer and storage architecture. Actually, I I implemented the Redshift uh, decoupled com uh, computer storage architecture, and uh, it works well. But for the uh, uh, but for for Redshift, it works. But it doesn't really mean that well, this kind of architecture works for works for uh, for for a stream processing system why because for s3 latency is so high while a stream processing system is sensitive to latency right every time we fetch the data from s3 what will you suffer we'll suffer actually 100 millisecond latency right and actually that's uh, that's probably the average latency for accessing uh, for issuing access uh, s3 s3 request so S3 request can be essentially can if you check the documentation, it can be as high as uh, probably 200 milliseconds or even 300 milliseconds. It's pretty high, and that's just one access, one single access. But think about okay, if we want to do state form, uh, state uh, state management, state uh, if we want to access state, 
we probably need to we probably need to issue thousands of uh, thousands of uh, 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 we need to probably issue thousands of S three requests every single every single second. Then, unfortunately, we cannot tolerate such kind of high latency. Right? It's not possible. So essentially, if we do not do any optimization, this architecture won't work at all. So to avoid uh, avoiding ac accessing remote storage ex uh, excessively, we actually introduced the tier storage technology, which is uh, quite, uh, also quite popular these days, right? So the for tier storage uh, technology, what is that, uh, that instead of decoupling the computer and storage uh, fully, we can essentially introduce the, let's say the some some caching layer, right? So the good thing here that really in in S three in AWS, sorry not in S three in AWS in GCP in Azure in any cloud services, they actually provide the uh, they actually provide different devices, right? For example, okay, in S3, they provide, uh, sorry, in AWS, it provides S3, which is a void host, which you can treat, consider it a void host storage. The local state is so fast, uh, I mean, that's where the local memory and the local disk, okay, it's so fast, much faster. But the problem here, that's where data will get lost, right? right? If the if the node crash it, then you can never recover data. And they also have the EBS, right? EBS means, well, it's a, it's a so you can consider it as a semi-persistent storage. Which is fast enough, but not as fast. But as uh, S three, uh, sorry, EC two, but uh, but much faster than S three, right? And it provides five nice durability. But essentially, in the in the industry, we do not really consider five nice durability as durable. So, yeah, you still need to consider it as the um, void hub, unfortunately. And the, at the at the bottom, we also have the S3, which is the persistent storage, which can be super slow, but it's purely durable, which means that's why it provides 11 nines of durability. So the uh, for tier storage, obviously, what we can do is that okay, we can have the hot data in in volatile storage, warm data in semi persistent storage, and in uh, persistent data in uh, uh, cool data in persistent storage. That's pretty common, right? That's pretty straightforward. But the thing here that okay, how we how to manage the data in different layers, right? Well, what's hot data, right? Well, how, how we can define uh, what data is hot data? How what data is so called warm data, and what data is cool data? Right? We don't know. No, so. Uh, what do we do? Um, then what we can do? Well, the simple thing we can do is that we can we can use the uh, some tree structure, log structure, merge tree structure, right? Um, uh, essentially, for for uh, LSM tree is the kind of structure that will the uh, that um, manage the manage the data in different levels, right? And every single level it has different runs, and the runs uh, and if we find that for data uh, in certain level. Uh, exceeds a threshold, certain threshold, depending on how, uh, depend on, probably depends on site, probably depends on the uh, some other uh, characteristics. Then we can compact the data from the upper layer to lower level, right? So, so with this uh, LSM tree architecture, we can essentially uh, uh, maintain the okay, recently accessed data. Uh, uh, cache the recently accessed data in the local local machine, and um, yeah, and, and then the upper uh, and then periodically run compaction process to compact the upper level runs, upper level runs into lower level runs. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, but unfortunately, it still doesn't really work. So the, the thing here that okay, look, well, the, the tier storage is pretty good architecture, right? Well, pretty good uh, idea, but it doesn't really work if you do not do any optimization. Why? The because well, the compaction in Amazon sheet can be super expensive, and it can cause high spikes, high latency, uh, high latency spikes, and unfortunately, the stream processing system is pretty sensitive to. Latencies are uh, two, two, two latencies, right? So that's a, a pretty, yeah, sensitive to too high latency, right? It doesn't really work. Then what we can do? Well, we can have two strategies adopted to solve the problem. The first one is remote compaction, and the second one is group compaction. 
what it means. For remote compaction, so why would it, uh, the compare? What's the problem with uh, local compaction? Local compaction uh, can cause trouble because so every time we do compaction, it will actually consume the CPU cycles, right? It will uh, consume CPU cycles, and which means that if you if you have a, a running stream processing in exactly the same machine, then those Computation processes cannot consume the CPU cycle, cannot gather CPU resource, and then they will get idle. That's why they cut cause high latency. But if we do remote compaction, which means that again we create a, a separate EC2 instances and do comp compaction in that machine, then essentially we can offload the compaction. Uh, well, we 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 can. Uh, we can get additional CPU. Essentially, that means that we need to get additional CPU resources to do the compaction, right? And then that also means that okay, local the local computation can still work, can still occupy all the CPU resources. Right? That's the big idea. And definitely, the uh, definitely sometimes we also find that okay, uh, using EC2 instances can be pretty uh, can be uh, pretty 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 expensive, right? In some cases, right? Then what we can do? The uh, the other option or the other strategy we can do is that essentially we can think about we, we can think about using the lambda function. So lambda function is purely service and is purely charged based on the I mean usage, right? Essentially, we do not need to create dedicated EC2 instances in the in the cloud environment. And uh, we can essentially use the lambda function to process compactions in a serverless way. And that's remote compaction. And the second compaction strategy we use, a uh, uh, second strategy we use to optimize the compaction is called group compaction. So, what it means, look, uh, in stream processing, well, in, in any database systems, well, if you run a query, it should not just be uh, have just one operator, right? You could will have several operators, right? Let's say that okay, in, in a streaming a stream a streaming query, you have both the aggregation and and the uh, aggregation and the join operators, right? Both streaming operators and the drawing operators can use uh, uh, both streaming operators and can uh, uh, both streaming operators and uh, 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 sorry both drawing operators and the group by operator or aggregation operators need to maintain their own state, right? And the compaction can happen at different time. But the problem here that's why if it happens different at a different time, even if we use remote, even if we use remote compaction, it can actually call, it can actually consume the network bandwidth, right? And sometimes where it's actually not necessary to consume the uh, consume the network 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 bandwidth. So what do we do with that we can consider doing these compactions together? Instead of scheduling the compactions separately, okay, scheduling a compaction for drawing and scheduling a compaction for the aggregation, we can essentially do some compactions together. So that well, the, these two compactions can share the compa compaction cycle. And that's the idea. So we also can think that's where this idea also works. Um, okay. But every even if we have the local, uh, remote compaction, the 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 problem is, is still not pretty. It's not perfect. Then you further you need to first do further optimization to optimize the to optimize the stream processing performance. Then what we can do? Well, here is a strategy we, we we adopted in our system. That is, well, we can optimize the internal state based on the operator access pattern. So think about okay, look. If you have a hash aggregation, the hash aggregation can be considered as the access pattern for that operator. It can be considered as the point access because we just okay access that uh, access the uh, the bucket, and if the match, we we do some aggregation, right? But that's point access. But for hash aggregation, because we have so many buckets, and every single bucket may have tons of may have dozens of. Uh, 
uh, uh, uh, tens of thousands of uh, uh, hundreds of even thousands of uh, of tuples. Then essentially, it's a kind of random scan. So these two operators uh, actually actually have different access patterns. So essentially, what we can do is that we can optimize the internal state architecture for each operator, right? So that's the optimization we can do. So to summarize, well, the remote uh, the uh, the limitations of the uh, the limitation of the decoupling storage can compute architecture is that remote storage can access access can incur pretty high latency, causing unpleasant user experience. And we we can definitely adopt a tier storage to solve the problem, but it only solves the partially solve the problem. And further optimization is need, uh, needed to to uh, yeah to to minimize the cache miss rate and to mitigate the uh, latency spikes. Well, cool. Well, actually, beyond uh, actually in stream processing systems, there are many other uh, optimizations we can do to further optimize the performance, right? Um, beyond the compute and storage coupling architecture, we can consider the drawing algorithms. As I just mentioned in the first few slides, here, if we want to draw five tables, five streams, right, we can actually, uh, we will actually generate, the optimizer may generate a left deep tree. And here, the, uh, the, we draw five tables, and uh, here, the depth is four, is four, right? The tree is so deep that, uh, that that it will can cause high latency because we need to join the first two streams together and then join the next stream, join the result with the supplier, and then join the result with a pass by, and then join the results with high orders, right? The tree is so deep and it can cause high latency. Then what do we do? What do we can do? So what do we do in our system is that we, we always trying to, we all we all we always try to reduce the depths. We we always try to uh, make sure that okay, we have a we have a, a tree of of, of uh, 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 a lower tree right or a tree with uh, with less depths right yeah in uh, in the optimization in all optimization uh, optimizer we always try to generate a bushy tree instead of a left deep tree because a bushy tree will will be will be shorter yeah. That's the join algorithms. Uh, that's the join algorithms. The optimization, join optimization algorithms. And the other thing we have, we 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 think it's important, but we haven't uh, implemented is the join occur optimization. Why streaming? Why streaming join so uh, so so challenging? Well, not just uh, not just about okay managing a state, but also about okay like the. The, the work uh, the optimization the customization uh, the cardinality estimation the end workload fluctuation we actually have no way in streaming systems we actually have no way to precisely measure the cardinality right we can, in in database systems uh, I didn't really check the uh, DuckDB but well, in database systems we actually can have uh, histograms but in stream processing systems because we're streaming data is unlimited. You can hardly measure the cardinality, right? We can have it's it's so difficult. But essentially, you can actually based on the workload, based on the workload, you can actually guess okay what the cardinality looks like, right? And then based on that, we can do query re-optimization, and that's something we believe that is pretty interesting to investigate. All right. Um, okay, so I want to skip this part for, and well, this is more about what the general, so if you are, for, I mean, if you are, if you guys are interested in, I mean, how the, how stream processing system is, uh, uh, implemented, uh, adopted in the industries, in the, in the real world use cases, then I can discuss this, but for the, but uh, yeah, to summarize, okay, just one minute, okay, in, uh, in the, in, in real world use case, in real world scenarios, stream processing systems are too typically uh, uh, used to support two scenarios. One is a streaming ETL. That is, well, 
users may have dozens of ORTB databases or dozens of messaging queues or dozens of file systems, right? Or all kinds of file systems. Streaming systems can essentially continuously ingest data from upstream systems, perform transformations, and deliver result into downstreaming systems. That's number one use cases. And number two use case is that okay, probably the user do not really probably the user do not really does not really want to use an additional system to do further computation, right? Like click cost out like that DB, right? Probably they do not really think that okay it's too much. Then what they can do is that okay, they can essentially do uh, do computation inside of the do a streaming entity inside of the streaming database, like writing wave, right? Where they you can directly connect. Reading with is a BI tool like SuperSet, Meta, MetaBase, Grafana, whatever, right? Or use a client library, Java, Python, Go, or Node, right? JS Node. Right? So these are the typical use cases. So yeah, I will skip this part. But we'll, yeah, if you're interested in the, yeah, the research opportunities, well, the one pretty, pretty interesting of user, uh, opportunity is the, the, the Matras view. So in writing wave, writing wave is a is a streaming database, right? Well, and uh, it rep represents a stream processing in materialized views. Different from Flink's, every Flink's job in are independent. Let's say that we have ten Flink jobs. These ten Flink jobs are actually independent. They do not really share any resources. But in in a streaming database, we actually use materialized view to represent streaming streaming uh, streaming. Uh, stream processing jobs, right? So essentially, we can build streaming processing uh, uh, materialized views on top of another materialized view, right? And all, uh, right? And basically, have cascading materialized views. And in this way, essentially, materialized views can share resources. So this is what in 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 the batch processing is called. Well, the the problem is called the shared real shared query optimization. But I think it's even more interesting. It's way more interesting in a streaming scenario. Um, and I, I think well, there should be some work, but well, definitely it's pretty way more interesting problem than a research problem than the batch processing problems. Um, yeah, this is how uh, this is how the how the how the job can be shared, right? Uh, how how the stream processing jobs can be shared, right? So not uh, for job sharing. It's interesting, not just because of resource, how we share the resource, but how we maintain the consistency, right? If we have a cascading materials views, build materials view on top of another materials view, how can we get, make sure that well, all these materials views are consistent, right? Because we're streaming, some streams can be fast, but sometimes some streams can be slow. Some computations can be easy, but some computations can be complicated, right? How we can make make sure that everything is consistent, which uh, that can be a very challenging problem, research problem. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, and for the for the last slide, I want to uh, uh, I want to mention something about well, the uh, the performance numbers, right? Mm, so here, yeah, we do not need to compare too much, but uh, uh, between Redding Wave and the Flink, right? Because well, Flink is a Java-based system, so it's not that uh, surprising that well, it's kind of slow. But here, essentially, you, we can compare the pur a, a purple bar with the yellow bar, and the yellow bar is with the re remote compaction, while the purple bar bar does not really have the remote compaction. It actually does the local compaction. So essentially, we can see that we're in some queries like this Q4, Q7, Q9. For these queries, you can see that once we do remote compaction, it actually can double the throughput, the, the y-axis is a throughput, right? We can obviously see that we're in, many, in many cases, it can double the, uh, can double the throughput, right? So that's, the, yeah, so yeah. Anyways, yeah, that, that shows how uh, that shows well the comp remote compression really works. So okay, the last slide. Okay, so uh, to summarize, well, the company in the computer storage architecture can enable the infinite and independent scaling of computer storage resources layers, right? And the architecture uh, is optimized for elastic scaling and the instant fit recovery. Internal storage can help mitigate the high latency issue. Uh, 
caused by remote access, but you definitely you really want to encourage the, some other advanced technologies, fine tune of uh, techno fine tune their technologies to further reduce the cache miss and uh, and uh, and uh, mitigate the latency spikes, right? And we also uh, and uh, as as I just mentioned, to actually beyond decoupling the computer storage, you can you also need to do much more optimization to further optimize the stream processing performance. And the external results show that okay, writing waves in potential can achieve better performance. All right, thanks.